Hey, it's George DiGiani. Of course, you know that if you're a friend of mine on my page, waiting for Dr. Webster to get on the call, we are going to uh, have a good discussion today, something that's not really discussed. I've not seen much research on it. Parts of what we'll be able to discuss today have research on them, and others don't because it's going to come from my, my 30 years experience in this industry. Um, I call this exercise intelligence because there is something that we have heard of many years ago, the game. And the way we look at things now as a, an exercise professional or a health professional is more about no brain, no gain. Hey, Doc. Hey, George. So I'm talking about kind of the beginning of where this stems from. You know, many years ago in the 70s, it was no pain, no gain. And now like, I'm going to try to make people listen to their body, listen to what feels right to them, not just to their body, but what feels right as far as what they're supposed to be eating versus what they're told to eat, what marketing says, right? It's yeah. got no, no, no brain, no gain, not necessarily pain. And so let's be more intelligent about it. And so I'm trying to help people have exercise intelligence and tell us or identify with yourself with what needs to change as you get older. And we're going to help you with what some of those identities could uh, to ha could help you focus on and what that is. Because my focus today, is really, it's really prudent to make necessary changes to our exercise protocol, regardless what that is, as we age. And prior to experiencing pain or biomechanical impediments to how we walk, stand, sit, exercise, and so on. And many people who do experience pain, I'm sure you've heard this before, Doc, um, lose motivation. Um, they often give up and I was there years ago. I hurt my shoulder or I hurt my ribs and I felt I couldn't do what I normally did to work out. So therefore I lost motivate motivation and it, and it really stunk until I had a way of getting past that. So how do you prevent pain and injury while keeping your independence? Another consideration that I'd want people to really sit down and identify what's most important to them when it comes to exercise. Is it about fat loss? Is it getting ready for your wedding day? Is it having sustained independence so you can drive your car as long as possible, so you can walk as long as possible, wipe your own butt so nobody else is doing it for you? Isn't that important? So the show is really geared toward, it's, it's everyone because I want to help people who are in their 20s and 30s to listen to what we're saying now because it'll be important when you hit 40 or, or earlier, depending on your lifestyle, but especially for the 40 plus today. Yeah, well, and, and this is, yeah, like you said, it's not just for the extreme elderly. It could be that, that maybe we focus on a certain age range and some of the changes that we might think are important for that age range, say, once you're turning 40 or 50, but it doesn't mean that these same principles can't apply to somebody who's in their 20s or 30s, because when you're in your teens, most likely your exercise is athletic-based in all likelihood, not, not everyone's, but for the most part. People are running, jumping, sprinting, doing explosive type of exercise because they want to be a better basketball player or soccer player or football player or whatever it may be. When you get into your 20s, you quickly realize that, well, I'm probably not going to be comp playing competitive athletics anymore unless you're one of the few lucky ones. So your exercise may change a little bit. And then in your 30s, the same thing can happen. So it's not just that when you turn 60, you need to do this. Just take these principles and apply them to whatever age range you're finding right now. And you realize that you can make progress or progressively modify your workout as you go through life and get a lot more benefit. And I think what you touched upon is saving yourself from a potential injury, which is the big deal. And, and that does derail so many people. I've, I've gone through that too. I had a, a minor shoulder injury in football. And every time I'd start doing bench press, I'd work up to a certain point and I'd be feeling great and I'd be getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And this happened to me like four times in my life. Once I get to the point where I'm bench pressing about 300 to 325 as a max, or maybe 225 for 10 to 12 reps, my shoulder would just feel like an ice pick was jabbed into it, and I'd have to stop, and it would just completely derail me for months. <clears throat> Again, so I had to figure out to work out smarter rather than just keep on doing the same thing as I got older. So I want to talk about the different type of exercises. We have the jogger, swimmer, yoga, yogi, whatever you call them and then the gym goer doing a little of everything. If you want to throw another one in there, we can. But before I give you what has been on my mind for about a year and a half at least, uh, when I walk my dog, I'm most creative. And this is something that came to me, 
and I know it intuitively is is um, going to be beneficial if people apply it. And I say intuitively because um, I'm using some of my experience, some of my observation that I'll tell you about here in a little while, but I don't have any studies to back up what I'm saying. I'm only going to go on what I have experienced. And then I know there's one study we can talk about when we discuss isometrics. But let's first talk about the jogger. Most joggers, when they run, do it the wrong way in the first place. It's incorrect because they land on their heel and then they go to the front of their foot. And every time you land on that heel, you throw all the forces into your ankle, knee, hip, back, all the way up into your neck. And you say, well, George, look at these joggers. They seem to be really healthy and so on. And we won't get into the catabolic part of that where they're breaking down muscles. We don't have to discuss that. But just the act of jogging and its impact on the body when you're doing it incorrectly. But as we age, since this is that type of show, the jogger, and, and, and if they want to be in accordance or in alignment with the studies, the studies say as we age, we need much more strength training than we do aerobic training. There's another discussion that says we don't need to do any friggin' aerobic training, but we won't get into that. For the person with the jogger and wants to do it, that's fine. But as you age, it's extremely important, especially for joint stability, uh, postural integrity, that you perform strength training and do so much more of that than your, your jogging. And we're not even into the meat of the show yet. I'm picking on certain uh, type of exercisers because there's something I'm going to get to that I've not even shared yet why I why I created the show. Doc, you want to jump in on any of that? I just want to ask you to, to elaborate a little bit on that because when you analyze the proper biomechanics of walking, it's as you describe the improper biomechanics of jogging. So when you walk, the best way to walk and the healthiest way to walk is that you strike on your heel first, you roll slightly to the outside of your foot, and then roll to your toe, and then you push off on the inside or big toe, so your foot's kind of rolling like that. That's the best way to biomechanically walk correctly. But what you're saying is when you jog, that heel first is actually the wrong way as far as impact on your joints and your and your overall lower body. Yeah, health. because when you, look at, when you look at a jogger, a jogger basically runs up and down. I mean, there's a little tilt there, right? I'm just being a little extreme. A sprinter does this. Yeah. Everything comes from the posterior chain of the body, which is your butt, your hamstrings, your, 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 your calves, right? The front plays a large role also, but the explosiveness, if you take a jog and turn it into a sprint, you cannot sprint heel to toe. It's impossible. It doesn't work, and the mechanics of the right. body will do that. And you never have to think, well, hold on, let me change my mechanics when I'm going to sprint. You just naturally start to go on the ball of your foot, ball mm -hmm. to the middle, right? Um, so, so the mechanics are, are, are different, but I don't want to get it too much into that. I want to move on because there's something that's really important that, like I shared earlier, the, 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 the creator, the impetus of this show came from, and I know it's important in my life, but I know it's important in everybody else's life. I just can't show you the science on it other than what you and I are going to discuss when it comes to isometrics. The next one is the swimmer. Easy. The swimmer, if you, all you do is swim, you lack gravity. That's not healthy for your bones. You absolutely need resistance or to load the bone outside of the water. So if you love to swim, hey, that's great, but do something else. You want to jump in on that, Doc? Oh, no, I agree. I mean, it's, it's great exercise. It, it provides a lot of cardiovascular benefit. It's good for flexibility and range of motion. It's low impact. So if somebody has a lot of problems with, you know, maybe they can't run or they can't sprint, they can get a lot of, of high intensity or at least moderate intensity exercise by using the resistance of water uh, without putting hardly any impact on the joint. So it's great for that, but don't think that it's the only thing you should do for the reasons that you mentioned. We need some gravity. We need more loading of the bone. Otherwise, you're going to develop osteoporosis as you get older. So now we have the yogi, person who does yoga. The yogi, everything they do is forward motion, or they're on their feet doing things, but you can't, as a yoga person, do any pulling. There's no seated row. There's no lat pull down. There's no one arm row. It's your own body weight against gravity, and you're, you're missing out on certain movements of the body. So even someone who does yoga, if that's your main focus, I'd say you need a heck of a lot more than that, unless, so this is gonna be me throwing my own information back in my face, unless, 
you're doing some of those couple yogas where they're doing some like crazy Cirque du Soleil stuff. Those Good people point. are very strong. But I Good. wonder, and I don't know the answer, I wonder if they're also uh, complementing it with strength training. I would imagine so. Those people are extraordinarily strong, ridiculously strong. Maybe, right. maybe some of the strongest people on earth, pound for pound. All right, so now let's go into the gym goer. Somebody goes into the gym, and the first thing they want to do is something easy. Let me, let me get on the dumbest machine that's ever been devised on the planet, the elliptical trainer. Oh, but George, there's no impact on my legs like what you talked about earlier. Oh, my God. Look at your body when you started the elliptical. Look at your body now. How much have you changed? <laughs> Good boy. <laughs> yeah. Well, How's that working that? for you? There's that. It's not going to be highly effective. And it also, there are problems. We've talked about this in the past, but there's problems with the alignment of where your feet are when you're doing an elliptical trainer. It's not the greatest thing because when you do an elliptical, you're, you're by definition going to be on it for a reasonably long period of time. So there's a lot of repetition or over and over and over um, long-term use on an elliptical if you're going to try to get gains from that. Um, and your feet are, are wide. They're not, they're not in a line. And if you watch someone run or sprint, their, their feet are virtually on a li an invisible line. Or if you drew an actual line, you would see that their feet are both pretty well overlapping on that line as they walk or run. That's how our hips are naturally angled and our knees are naturally angled so that when we make impact, we have this slight medial or, or toward the middle position of our foot. That's when our hip and knee are properly aligned. If you put that weight on your, all of your weight onto those joints and you're wider than that midline, you're actually putting strange stresses on the knees and the hips. And that's why I don't really like the elliptical because you can damage your knees and hips, even though you think that you're putting less impact, which you are putting less impact, but you're putting negative stresses on those joints. So I don't like that machine for a lot of reasons. Plus and it doesn't do that much good. And if you're not strong, you're in, in more trouble because the muscle strength can't hold, the, all the connective tissue can't hold that, that joint in position uh, as long. And over a period of time, you're going to hurt yourself. So the other one is machines in general. So fixed path of motion machines. You get on a machine, and let's say you're doing chest press, and you want to scratch your nose, you're still doing this, and the other side's still moving. Fixed path of motion and dependent machines are dangerous for us because they leave out all the other muscles that if you're on a bench press, with dumbbells, they're independent, and they can fall all over the place. That means many more muscles have to come into play to balance them. So there's that. Uh, and then the same routine. People who stick with the same routine day in, day out, you're asking for trouble because not only are you not going to get the results you want, right, because you're bored and you're just not putting as much effort in, but <clears throat> the body needs change. It moves yeah. in different ways. Therefore, you need to complement that. Before I go on with the, really the meat of what I'm trying to get at today, you want to talk about that, Doc? No, I, I mean, I could reiterate what you're saying. I love the, the multiple path thing that you talked about with the dumbbells. When you're on a machine that has a fixed path, whether it's like a Smith machine where it's straight up and down or whether it's one of the – I've used a universal machine in the past. It's kind of on an arc, but it's on a very fixed arc where you're doing the press. There's nothing that allows you to possibly do this or do this or do any other – range of motion, do, do this, you can't do that. So those muscles pretty much just turn off while you're just pushing through that, that arc of motion. While you can use that to your advantage in certain instances, you don't want to turn off all the other muscles that you would require in real world. Because when you go to push yourself off the floor, uh, maybe in a push up, or maybe just simply getting off the floor because you had to get down there to do, do something, those muscles that would normally stabilize you from all those other ranges of motion, haven't been strengthened properly and you can damage yourself or injure yourself or you just simply won't have the strength to do it especially when you get older and you need to lift a box onto a top shelf because you haven't developed all those stabilizing muscles which is really as important as the prime mover muscles that would allow you to, to make that lift you have to train all of the muscles in concert so i'm looking at a comment here from burke if anybody else has any questions or comments you can uh, certainly uh send them here and we'll, we'll address them but burke I don't really understand your comment. Guys at the gym, uh, me, meaning himself, you do things the hard way. I don't know what that means. So <laughs> if you want to expand upon that, you can. But I'm going to get into to the meat of, of this now, why I created this show, because I think it's really, really important. I want people just to sit with this, especially any medical professionals who may be watching this. Um, at least half of all of my friends, and I have a lot of friends, 
are physicians of some type. Dr. Webster is a chiropractor. I have many chiropractor friends. I have many medical doctor friends. Um, uh, a, a, a psych, two psychologist friends. And so I learned a lot from them of everything that I was never taught in all of my advanced training throughout my life. Um, I wanted to see if there was a comment on there. So one of the I things- think, I think I, what Burke was saying is that the guys, other guys at the gym tell him that he's doing everything the hard way. And I think he's, he's pointed that out that if you want to do it right, sometimes it is the hard way. A dumbbell controlling it in all the different paths of motion is harder than a machine where, like you said, you can take one hand off and take a sip while you're doing that. <laughs> you can't do that with a, with a dumbbell or a barbell. So, right. yeah, I get what you're saying, Burke. And, and sometimes doing the hard way is the only way to really get things done. So, so with that said about qualifying, wait, hold on, somebody else. Oh, Burke said 100% agree. By staying off the machines, I'm always wearing a weight belt, vest, adding things to make them tougher lift lots of weights no machines so burke this is uh and thank you for your compliment your comment on that uh this is a show for another time but the first thing i think of right away is how how we are often driven in life to perform in a certain way that the majority of the other people will not perform so you have people who are navy seals you have people like the the the, the bodybuilders martial artists, all the stuff that I've done most of my life, where that drive came, for me, in my experience, came from an insecurity. And I used it through incredible focus in my physical life. Um, and a lot of people don't have that drive, regardless of where it came from. So therefore, they want things the easy way. And that's the masses, by the way, that want that. And that's fine. But I, I don't get upset with people who don't have the motivation that they need to have to address the desires they want to have because I have oh, more passion. Yeah, very true. And I also want, go, George, I also wanted to just mention to, to uh, Burke, I believe was his name, uh, yeah. that this isn't really the topic of the show today, but last show was in part directed exactly at this topic. So go to our very last show that we did on Facebook Live and we talk about the, the differences in certain uh, amounts of brain activity required for a certain type of lift. And I compared it to the, the, the teacup ride at the state fair versus the riding in the F-16. Um, the amount of brain activity it takes is completely different. And the more brain activity you're using, like Burke's mentioning, doing stuff with body weight and weighted vests and free range of motion, it takes a lot more brain activity and therefore you get a lot more benefit from it. So I, we didn't I, talk I about that. More more brain activity and, I, and, I, and I know it gets more brain activity and I think that's great. What I'm saying is, that not everybody has the drive he yeah. does, or that even I once had. Um, I still have a lot of drive more than most, but nothing like I used to have whatsoever because my motivations have changed, my priorities have changed, but I'm st I look at life now more holistically instead of such a focus on having the lift. I used to squat 700 pounds. I mean, I was a big meathead, but that was my main focus. Now today, you know, I, 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 I don't do anything like that at all. I don't even do squats that are weighted on my shoulders. But but let's let's take it down for a moment. Someone just someone else just commented, and I, I want to just read it real fast, and then we can move on. Um, Rob Rob said he's 44, does triathlons. He also lifts most days of the week. But I am worried doing 10 hours of cardio a week, and so should you be, Ron, or was it Rob? It's Rob. Rob. You should you you should be. be for two reasons. Number one, if intuitively it doesn't feel right. This is one of the reasons for this show today. You need to like dial it down significantly. Number that number two, if you don't look the way you want to look, if you find that at 44, you don't look like you did when you were 34 and you realize there's muscle breakdown, you're not as strong. Maybe your sleep is a little bit off. Maybe you have sugar cravings because all of that cardiovascular or aerobic work stresses the body. Then you really need to dial it back and listen to your body. Because if the intention is to be healthy, you're working against your own goals, right? So let's move forward now. I, what I was saying earlier is I've been blessed to have at least half of my friends who are physicians, and I have also been blessed to be able to be in an operating room with a friend of mine who's an orthopedic surgeon. So he's working on shoulders and back and knees and hips and ankles and wrists and so on, elbows, right? Um, I've seen at least 100 surgeries. I've been right there next to him when he's and, and, you know, it's, it, it added to my toolbox of knowledge, right? I had all my advanced degrees that I had, big deal. 
But when I worked with people and had certain experiences with them and I was in the operating room and learned from the doctor what they're seeing as a result of, it helped me to, to combine the two of everything that I had learned about preventative and then looking at the damage of the people who aren't listening. So you have skydivers. Number one, hip fractures come from skydivers because they're landing so hard so many times. Yeah. We always think the elderly population, it's not always them, even though it's a big population. And it's not like everybody's skydiving. I'm just letting you know that that's a big consideration that most, of, uh, most people don't consider. Um, you have age, you have auto accidents, you have being overweight, all of these things that compromise, and now that's, this is what I'm getting to with this show, your joint, your postural integrity, and your cartilage. What am I getting at? Okay, so this is what really came to me and I wanted to share. I realize our joints only have so many repetitions in them. They only have so many, they can only move a certain way, get us up and down stairs, in and out of a car, all that stuff, so many times because as we age, we are breaking down connective tissue, cartilage is dwindling away, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't exercise. We just need that balance of what that is. It's imperative to be as strong as we possibly can as we age. That does not mean bodybuilder biggest muscles possible. You and I have talked about this in the past. If you're exercising between one and five or one and six repetitions, you become very, very strong, but not necessarily very big. There's a difference where hypertrophy comes in, you start to gain muscle without going into all of that. I want everybody to stay focused now on what I'm getting at. As we age, it is of my opinion, especially if you've been an exerciser for many years, not somebody new, that you need to dial back your repetitions because by loading the joint and having thousands and thousands of repetitions throughout your life, Regardless of how, how well you eat and how healthy you are and your, and your muscle structure and so on, you're losing even more of that, that protective joint cartilage. And it's because of that repetition with added weight on it. So what do we need to do? Well, before I go there, I want you to like interject, comment on that, and then we can start moving forward beyond that. Okay, this is really interesting. Um, what you're saying is, is based on well, some of the science that I know that, that talks about this is saying that our joints really have a very long um, capacity for doing repetitions or almost an infinite capacity for doing repetitions until they get damaged. If you analyze what the cartilage looks like before it's damaged, you can pretty much keep doing whatever you're doing almost infinitely, as long as you're nourished and healing and sleeping and doing all the things that you need to do. Um, and you're working within proper biomechanics. But then once a joint tissue gets damaged, the tissue itself starts to, to change. And at that point, use seems to be very degenerative on that joint. So I see what you're saying, and, we, and, and probably you're onto something because I don't know if we can go through life you know, doing huge amounts of repetitions forever without assuming that we are at some point going to damage or slightly damage that tissue. And at that so point, yeah, it's going to be very degenerative. Let, let, let me give a, a, a perfect example. And again, this show is for people who have been exercising for a long period of time. If you have any questions or comments you want to interject, you can. I'm going to give an example of what most people are guilty of and they don't realize that they're doing something that's working against them and creating damage. While I was in the operating room, I saw um, a person who needed reconstructive surgery on their knee, uh, a new ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, they pulled it from their semitendinosus, which is part of your hamstring muscle down at the tendon, they ripped that out and they create a new uh, ACL for you. So you're using your own, your own body's uh, tissue. And in, in that discussion, we talk about how people can uh, get that, make that area thinner, even rupture, and where cartilage tends to wear away with certain type of activity. One of those activities is people who get on a a leg extension machine. And Burke, if you do this, I... Millions of people struggle with sugar cravings, excess fat, overeating, cholesterol issues, and high blood pressure. Every diet created in the past 30 years has been too restrictive, bland, or fails to meet your desires. There's a solution steeped in evidence-based science dating back to 1920, and it's not changing anytime soon. 360 Degree Health created the Keto Cleanse to be the easiest, best-tasting solution without feeling restricted by calories. Their Keto Cleanse 
Atkins forces your body to use fat for energy, even if you don't exercise daily. Recipes include cheese, meat, guacamole, and other favorite foods to help balance hormones, blood pressure, and cholesterol with the science to prove it. Tim Tebow, Dr. Oz, Dr. Osborne, and many other doctors discuss the health benefits of keto. Check out their videos at 21daybodymakeover.com. Click on the yellow keto button. Now for a limited time, receive free shipping. Receive four professional-grade supplements, cookbook, amazing desserts, such as cheesecake and brownies. That's 21daybodymakeover.com. I highly suggest you stop immediately. Don't even do one repetition, not even light, re light weight. Stay away from it. Leg extension, you're sitting down, and you lift your leg up and down, and the weight is closest to your, your foot, right? You're sitting there, and you're lifting your legs away from you. Mm -hmm. What you're essentially doing is your, if this is your knee and your patellar tendon is here, every time you load this area and push out, you're pulling down on the patellar tendon, which then pushes down on the kneecap, which then pushes down on, creates the shearing motion on the cartilage. You're wearing your cartilage away. Do your legs look fantastic? Absolutely. I think you look the best that you've ever looked, but you can't walk. <laughs> so That's true. Here, right yeah yeah this is this is what shearing motion means you have the upper leg you have the lower leg and there's the knee joint in between where it joins this is shearing you don't want that in your knee and that's exactly what you're creating when you put a force down on that foot and you're fully extended like that in a leg extension you sh it, there's a shearing force that is a necessary part that joint is trying to maintain that leg from falling off so you create all these strange forces in your knee it's not good So uh, I was reading Burke's comment, and he said, no, he doesn't do them. And that, and that, I didn't figure he did. <laughs> so, so let's also talk about, and I don't want to go through every exercise. I just want people to see how they're creating damage, and they don't realize it, even if they don't feel pain. Because today's show is to be preemptive, right? We don't want you to get to that point of experiencing pain or joint, joint integrity issues when you do the lateral raise. So you have a dumbbell in your hand. It's furthest away from you, if you can see me in the camera. And you're exactly creating shearing motions. People who do bench press and they come all the way down to get that stretch, doc, you're creating shearing motions. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't exercise. It's identifying biomechanically what's good for us, what isn't good for us. Uh, range of motion is going to be different for everybody. If you have a massive chest, your range of motion is going to be shorter if you're performing a bench exercise than someone who doesn't have that. When people do pull-ups, They'll often, do, or even pulling down to the front of their chest. They'll often do whatever they can because to get the range of motion so it can come down as far as possible and then they collapse. And this collapsing motion, motion actually does it. Like this. Yeah, right. When you do the collapsing motion, not only does it change the primary mover of the intended goal, but you're creating joint integrity issues. So with that said, bringing everything back to why I created the show today, it is imperative that we dial back on our repetitions when we're working out, especially when we're older. So if you want to keep doing those goofy exercises, you can. But would you like your joints to last longer? I would recommend not doing those goofy exercises, number one. And number two, instead of doing 12, 15, 25, 50 reps, three sets of each, why not do five reps, hold for five reps, do eccentric re uh, 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 training. So what, what that means is, Let's go back to the chest again, since I used that in the beginning. You do five reps of intense weight. That doesn't mean lift light. Do your intense weight. And then from there, you have a spotter maybe, and you come down extraordinarily slow, the eccentric phase, and you do that for about four seconds. Let me tell you something. Four seconds is the longest four seconds you'll ever have in your life. Coming down toward your chest and counting a real four seconds. You then have somebody help you explode up, so it's not challenging on the way up and do the same thing on the way down, then do that for five reps. So you're minimizing your amount of repetitions, you're getting more intensity in, and you're saving the joint. That's just one idea. You wanna get into isometrics, Doc, or you wanna comment on that? No, I love where you're going with this because you're basically bringing up all the stuff that, that we found in rehab is really good for, for tendon therapy and tendon rehabilitation. So you've intuitively stumbled upon something that I think it has really good sound scientific basis of doing not just regular positive motion or, or it's called concentric. You, you said emphasize occasionally, 
the eccentric. Eccentric just means the negative. So if, if I'm doing a bench press, most people just relax on the way down and then pick, and push up. And that's all they're worried about is the pushing up. But you're saying go slow on the way down. So emphasizing the negative, that completely loads the joint differently. And we found, at least in some studies, they're showing that that's one of the better ways that we can, we can um, approach tendinopathies or, or disease or degenerative or inflamed tendons, tendon pain. Um, that's one of the best ways we can approach that. And isometrics, which I think you're about to bring up, is another way in some of the studies. And it really depends on which tendon you're looking at. But loading the tendons differently than just the normal pushing, pushing up, um, seems to be quite good on your joints. So they also look at strength gains and people who perform more eccentric training. So wherever you're lowering the weight, whether it's in a squat or chest press or biceps away from you, whenever you're lowering the weight and you're doing so very, very, very slowly, and then you have somebody help you up so you don't have much effort on the way up, and you do that again, that you gain more strength that way than you do with the concentric or move and, and moving with, with momentum. Now you say, George, hold on, that's gotta be extremely hard. And uh, you know what, you're right, it's extremely hard. However, yeah. you're saving the joint, you get stronger, you don't do as many reps, but does it matter if you look better, feel better, and you're safer? I mean, isn't that the intended goal? When we exercise, is it all about vanity? I mean, George, uh, the way I understand this, when you do the, the negative portion or the eccentric, the big gain that you get compared to the normal concentric is more in muscle hypertrophy. Um, yes. As opposed, it's, more, it's muscle hypertrophy. So you'll get the big volume, voluminous muscles. If you look at a bodybuilder these days, they're grinding out slow reps. They're not pumping the weight in fast, fast repetition. They're, they're grinding a slow rep down and a slow rep up. And that's how they're getting these massively gigantic muscles. So that's, that's where you benefit on the, on the eccentric side, as well as the tendon loading. So, so before we get to isometric, Burke just wrote and asked if the uh, pull-up motion is similar to a muscle-up right before you pop up. You want to comment? It's not the greatest lift in the world, that's for sure. It's not the best on your shoulders. Um, Why? Pop -up, doing a pop-up seems to be this popular thing these days. And yeah, you can train yourself to do that, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a good thing. I mean, I guess if you have to climb over a wall in real life, it's maybe good to be able to do that. But I've never had to climb over a wall since I was a kid. And I probably shouldn't have been climbing over those walls when I was a kid. So is it so, a great I mean, I look at it. I talked to a medical doctor friend of mine about this. He lives in uh, South Texas. And I don't see it as a terrible thing. And I'll tell you why. Because there's not a hell of a lot of repetitions to it. If you're doing a lot that's of big. you know, that's my, that's my only advocate for people who want to do that it's so much better than doing a lateral raise for your shoulders or knee extensions on a machine so much better for you you have to weigh the pros and cons how do you feel has your posture changed is there any pain are you gaining the results you want do you have the strength now that you need maybe you can move away from that and go do something else and come back to it all of that so now let's get into isometrics it's boring as hell I hate isometrics, but there's some good science that's come out that talks about the benefits of isometrics. Talk about saving the joint, and that's what this show is about. Doc, why don't you get into it first? Isometrics can be extraordinarily beneficial. The, the benefits that I've seen um, are, are twofold. One is when you do an isometric, which means that you're pushing hard, but you're not moving anything. So let's say, for example, your, your max bench press is 200. Well, load on 500 pounds so that you know for sure that you're not going to be able to do it. And then just push on that bar as hard as you can and push for maybe 30 seconds to, to a minute and a half. It's, it's grueling. And I'm talking push, 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 push. You're not going to move it because you can't lift that much weight. That's an isometric movement. And what you're going to find when you do isometrics as opposed to regular concentric or eccentric is you don't get the volume of muscle mass change but you develop strength like crazy. And they've also shown that using isometrics, we can use isometrics really effectively for tendinopathies, also like the eccentric. And isometrics is often where you start because it's easy to do an isometric movement. If you have, say, tennis elbow, which is a tendon issue on the outside of the elbow joint, you can put pressure on your hand or your, or your wrist joint and flex that muscle. 
it's just, that muscle w- would make me do this. But if I press on it and I don't m- allow it to move and I just sit there in a static position, tendon pain seems to melt away when you have problems with that tendon. So it's wonderful for reducing tendon pain and it's w- extraordinarily good for developing strength in the muscles, but you're not gonna develop as much size. So if you don't want the mass, but you want strength, it's probably the best way to go. Another reason I like isometrics for people, especially who have limitations as you get older, if you have joint pain in your shoulders or where, wherever that might be, and you can't do a push up or chest exercises, if you're able to get into a push up position and not move, you've done a really good job. You're still exercising. You say, yeah. oh, well, this is too easy. Okay, we'll stay in that push up position for a minute to a minute and a half and do three sets of it or four sets. Let me know if it's still too easy. <laughs> exactly right. Right? And then when that becomes too easy, ask uh, uh, your child to lay on your back and, and get in that position. Don't do anything. You know, keep adding weight to it. But, but so if you have a limitation, but there's a certain range of motion you can get into and not move and not feel pain, provided, provided caveat here, it's biomechanically safe. Can't tell you how many times I see people do lunges and squats and all this stuff and they're coming off their heel just a little bit. You're immediately throwing the forces into your knees and lower back, and you're not using the primary mover the way you should be or want to be. And again, you're creating damage to the joint. That's why I think we need to do less repetitions as we age, more strength stuff, but and especially the isometric stuff. It's, it's important, I think, also that we identify. You know me with the psychological part, Doc. The reasons that we're exercising. If you're exercising for fat loss, good luck because it's not a sustainable reason. If you're exercising to get ready for your wedding and you hadn't exercised before, good luck with the having that body again because you're going to lose it after the honeymoon or that's what tends to happen. So make sure to do those things. What else you want to hit in this, Doc? I want to talk a little bit about um, some techniques to use when you do isometrics. Mm. Let's, let's take a bench press, for example, because that's an easy one to talk about. If you, if you get on a, let's say, let's say it's just a bench press rack where it's a barbell bench press and you load 500 pounds, like I said. And you start pushing on that. You're pushing at the very, very, very top of that range of motion, which is fine, but you, that's not the only way that you want to do it. You want to actually work out in at least two, but preferably three planes of mo- – three uh, – what would you call it? Three, three levels of stretch or places in that movement. So, so you can see this. I would get on a machine and load the weight about right here and push hard right there for one set, and then about halfway up, push hard right there for one set, and then about two thirds of the way up, press hard right there for one set. If I was going to do three sets, I would do them in three different positions within the lift rather than just do every one at one position because you're creating, creating imbalance in your muscles. You're not going to be strong at the bottom of the, of the lift. And when you have to get up off the floor, you're not going to have any strength in the bottom, but you might be super strong at the top because that's the only place that you've trained your muscles. So this is where a Smith machine comes into place. Yes. If you're using so much weight, you can't lift it, which is what we're trying to mention to you here. You would put the Miss Smith machine at the bottom of the repetition, which is, which is 90 degree angle at your elbow. Your elbow should make a 90 degree angle. If you go lower than that, you begin to deactivate the chest muscles. I didn't say you deactivate them. I said you begin to deactivate them. People always change the words around and you begin to activate too much of the anterior of your shoulder. Okay, while both of those sets of muscles are in play, which one's bigger, the anterior shoulder muscle or the chest? The chest. Yeah. You don't want the small muscle getting that much burden. You, want to, you don't want to create so much uh, shearing in the, in, the, in the shoulders, and you get no shearing in the shoulder with isometric training. So it's just this is some of the stuff I really wanted to mention today. Last thing I'll mention uh, right now, uh, that, and I, we mentioned this on one other show, is to, to look up Dr. Stuart McGill. He's a professor of spine biomechanics. I want everybody to look up his big three. Put in Dr. McGill, M-C-G-I-L-L, in YouTube, um, big three. And you'll- the 1920s produced the ketogenic diet for people with epilepsy and has a plethora of scientific proof showing the benefits of rapid fat loss, decreased insulin levels, improved sleep, and brain function. Eating high-fat food while significantly decreasing carbs turns your body into a fat burner from a carb burner. Dr. Myhill said the brain and heart run at least 25% more efficiently on a ketogenic diet. How many times have you been disappointed by fat loss results? Less than optimal organ function due to poor lifestyle choices 
choices, slow or minimize desired results on any diet. We created the first and only Keto Cleanse system to be the fastest fat loss program on the market by combining the correct keto diet with a full body cleanse. Change from being a carb burner to a fat burner today. Visit 21daybodymakeover.com slash keto, click on Keto Cleanse and receive cleanse supplements, a keto cookbook with desserts such as keto brownies and grocery list recipes and exercise videos. That's 21daybodymakeover.com slash keto. See his, it's an old video showing his big three exercises for core stability. So when we're talking about repetitions and so on, if you're doing a, a push down for your triceps, the back of your arms, right? When you're standing, if your, um, if your abdominal muscles are weak, then you can't push down. You can't push as much weight. If your abdominal muscles are very strong, then you can push down more weight. So think of your entire core, which is your, your, your TBA. It's the, the transverse abdominis. Those are the muscles that wrap all the way around your spine. It's the deepest abdominal muscles. You never see those. All the way to the outer abdominal muscles and your lower back. And then all the muscles that surround your hips. All of that is your core. And think of that as the trunk of a tree. Trunk of the tree is the most stable part of the tree. Above that, it has branches. Below that, it has roots. The trunk of the tree is what helps the branches to remain stable and not make it fall over in addition to the roots. So if your trunk, your core is strong, you can do more with your arms and more with your legs. It's absolutely right. If, you, if you're having trouble putting that box on that shelf up there, you probably don't need to make your arms and legs stronger. You probably need to make your core stronger. Everything else just works better after that. So before we go, if anybody has any comments or questions, we can address those right now. Otherwise, make sure to share this with your friends. Uh, as many people as you possibly can, share this, share this, share this. It helps us a lot to get exposure. Uh, I will have the full write-up. I have a, a link that will go in there also. It will be on my 21 Day Body Makeover Facebook page. It won't be on this one. I'll share this right away. But the entire write-up about this and all of these shows will be on my 21 Day Body Makeover Facebook page. With that said, my website is 21daybodymakeover.com. Dr. Webster's website is completehealthdallas.com. Nobody uh, has sure. any questions, Dave. Uh, uh, Dr. Webster, Dave just gave us a thumbs up. So thanks, everybody. Any last uh, closing thoughts, Doc? Yeah, I was going to ask you. So you have a write-up that's talking about this progressing to this different type of exercise where you're involving some eccentric and isometric exercises. You've had, that, you have a write-up for that? I don't have that write up. It's really just the write up of what we discussed today. No, I didn't write all of that up. It's it's okay. I because think I want to give many people variables to do that with. Okay, I want to give people a little bit of specifics as far as if they're going to try to make this move, so that people understand for sure. If you're saying that that maybe you've done three sets of twelve to fifteen reps on the bench press normally, and you just do normal reps, are you saying that you should take each one of those sets down to maybe do? five sets of concentric, five eccentric, and then a little bit of isometric within one set? Or would you rather do one set of concentric like you would, and then the next set do all eccentric, and the next set do all isometric? I'm glad you said that, because that, we're, we're, that takes me back to our conversation we had a couple of days ago, which is within that one set, I would like to see people perform some concentric, which is their normal movement of an exercise, whatever that exercise is, if you want to, and then the other half, let's say it's 12 repetitions, six concentric, six movement of normal concentric, six eccentric, down slowly three or four seconds each time you come down. That means it's going to be much more difficult when you get to the last six because you've already moved the first six and you might need a spotter. You could even do six concentric, moving normal again, just to remind you what that is, and then six isometric. But then at that point, you have to help somebody hold it there uh, in place for you so it doesn't just come down on you. So it's, you could even, let me give you another example. Six concentric moves of chest press and then six eccentric, again, slow on the way down. Get off the bench, go into an isometric push-up, and hold that for 15 to 20 seconds or longer. And that's one set. Okay. That's pretty good. I'm glad we broke that down a little bit. And so you can do that with, with just about any exercise. Yeah, that'll help people a lot more so they have something real concrete in their mind. Good. All right, Doc. Well, great show. Thank you so much.
Thanks, George. See you soon.